Hello and welcome back to a recap of today's automating GIS session which was on um, how to use Python in GIS to automate tasks. And I'm especially going to walk you through um, the exercise or through the example we, we saw which was um, to write Python script which goes into the processing toolbox. Um, for that, I already downloaded the data, uh, which you can find in exercise two. Um, there should be a link somewhere here, yes. This uh, data here. I already downloaded it and opened it. Uh, just to remind you, it's this uh, species range for a uh, family of fish, which is called the damsel fish. And it's a number of polygons with a long list of columns uh, giving details about the species and about its protection status and where this species would live. And because this is, these are so many different species, you can see how there's overlapping areas where there's more than one species. And also there, there is uh, multiple species which have more than one range polygon. Just to have you, you have an idea what, what kind of data we're dealing with it here. And um, the task of today is uh, to use, to develop a processing toolbox uh, script, which would um, extract one raster for, the, for like a global coverage raster uh, containing uh, a coverage for or species range for uh, each of each single of those species in this data set and um, maybe to quickly revisit uh, the processing toolbox is uh, all kinds of uh, GIS tools such as uh, let's see uh, buffer tools or simplification or also raster operations different ones like um, also um, elevation map op operations and uh, also uh, conversion scripts. So we would have here, for example, rasterize, uh, convert a vector to a raster. Um, and all of these tools can be uh, combined uh, to create simple automata automation uh, in these uh, processing models like there's this graphical modeling tool uh, where you can define an input or more than one or two one or more inputs um, and operations for it and because all of these operations basically take an input layer or input data set of, of one kind or another um, and output another data set, which typically is also a layer. Um, it's easy to chain these operations into, uh, into a process to finally to run multiple operations at once. So this would take the input layer, create a buffer, simplify it and, and save it to an output layer. And if I now enter here a name like buffer plus simplify and also assign it a group, I can save it in the default location. And it was correctly saved. And I would show up here in models just as any other of these tools. And if I double click that, I have this simple user interface where I can say, uh, uh, choose an input layer, um, choose an output layer, but I don't have to. It, it would be saved as a temporary layer otherwise and run this algorithm. And it would complete on this layer. Yeah, 
is now a bit funny, funny output because we were buffering in um, degrees, um, which which is obviously varying uh, by latitude and produces funny, um, f funny geometries, especially for uh, features which cross the date line. Let's get rid of that again. Um, now there's uh, a second, uh, like having having uh, seen this processing toolbox, we, we go somewhere else uh, for a moment and return there soonish. Um, Python is underneath a lot of things in QGIS. Uh, the processing, most of the processing tools, for example, are written in Python. Actually, uh, then all kind of plugins you you might install might have installed already. They're uh, all written in, in Python with some exceptions, but mostly. Um, and um, there's also, for example, a way of, no, of, yeah, of uh, using Python for, no, that was wrong. Where did it go? Oh, here, yes, there it is. Uh, a Python for uh, building filtering expressions, although apparently it doesn't work here, but it should work in here. And it's opened somewhere else. It's also possible to use uh, Python as, as, as uh, to, to define uh, Python functions for custom and advanced uh, filtering expressions. Uh, but that's actually not where we're going today. Let's let's keep it a bit simpler. Um, I'm going to show you this Python console, which is a direct API uh, access to like console within QJS, which allows um, access to most objects you see in this interface uh, via a documented uh, API. And um, here, let, let's dive right in here. Like it already tells us that uh, there's a, an object uh, called iFace exposed, which is the entire interface here. And uh, this iFace is uh, a class, an object of class Q, Q, QGIS interface. Um, and as, as this help tells us up here too, there's an online help system included and in, in, built in into this console. So if I type help and and then a variable name, it would give me um, some API description of uh, what is built in uh, it, uh, about the class of this variable, like the type of this variable. Um, this online help might be okay for, uh, let's say, simpler objects, which only have like 10 ish methods and variables. Um, but uh, fortunately, there's also um, uh, resources to, to look these, uh, to, to which document these APIs in, in a better way. So if we go back to the lesson seven um, and skip to the next uh, part, uh, there's a link here to the PyJS cookbook, um, which which is actually the wrong link. <laughs> On the bottom, there is a link to the uh, QGIS, PyQGIS API documentation, uh, which uh, exp uh, like, uh, explains all of the exposed Python APIs. That's not everything, like, but most functions in QGIS. So we just looked at this interface variable which was uh, of type uh, QGIS interface and I now quickly searched on this page and found on, on this uh, table of contents of the Python API documentation um, and if I open it it will tell me uh, how this class uh, defines the interfaces uh, exposed by, by QGIS and we're going to search now for one particular function, which I want to show you, which is active layer. 
which uh, gives us a reference to the active layer, to the layer which is selected currently in the map window. So we can try that over here to use the active layer and that will return us um, an object of, of uh, type QT, QTS vector layer. Be careful here, there's some classes uh, which have QTIS in, in the beginning of their name in the namespace, uh, which are generally more the interface and, and uh, the user interface classes, uh, while most of the classes, especially core uh, things in, in QTS, such as layers and features, only have QTS. That's an easy typo. Um, I already looked up for you in, in the same API documentation that if I now have a layer, this layer in, in a variable, that this layer has, has a method which is called name, which allows us to see what's the name of that, of that layer. And you can see it correlates, interesting enough. Uh, and another one I want to uh, demonstrate here quickly is feature count. So we could also say it as 231 features. Obviously there's a lot more uh, methods available for complex uh, classes such as a QT QTS vector layer, um, but we don't need them for right now. Instead, uh, I'm still gonna quickly show you this IPython console. This is something you have to install um, as a plugin, it's called IPy console, um, and it's a bit more advanced uh, Python console, which has better features and and it's a bit like a notebook, except that you can't save it so easily, like only on on the console itself. Um, what you need for that uh, though, and which is uh, bit cumbersome to install, especially on Windows, is uh, these two model, uh, modules, which is Jupyter and Qt console. Um, there's a link in the, in the written documentation, uh, which, which explains a bit how that works. So I already installed that plugin. And if I now open the IPython console, then this looks a lot like what we just had. There's again, iFace exposed. There's also canvas exposed, which is the map canvas. And we can again play the same game of saying, we get hold of the active selected layer and count its features. Same, same slightly different, but uh, very, uh, a lot more convenient. It features, for example, proper uh, tab completion, completion. So if I now have layer and I know I want to say feature count, like feature C and hit the tab key, it would complete the, the function. Um, also, while the, the um, parentheses are open, it would tell me um, the, the help for, for this particular function, which is quite handy. Now, back to these processing toolbox scripts. Um, all of them are also available as uh, Python uh, functions or Python modules or they can be run from Python. The uh, whole thing is stored inside a module called processing, and we go we're going to import that here. Um, and um, processing has has a lot of, uh, has uh, these uh, different providers. That's, uh, for example, these are native or QGIS uh, provided uh, algorithms or GDAL is, is a separate provider, or GRASS is a separate provider. You might also have uh, SAGE GIS as, as a separate provider, depending on your installation. Um, and 
there is currently no good documentation, no easy way to find out uh, how they're how they're called. We we know we can't work with uh, this this uh, human readable description because that's uh, also translated into different languages, so it would not work on on say a Finnish language computer. Um, but uh, all of these um, tools, all these these this, yeah, tools in the processing toolbox, uh, also have an ID. Um, and um, there used to be something called um, the alg list uh, function of processing, but unfortunately that doesn't exist anymore. Um, instead, we we have to query the QGIS application processing registry. Um, so if we use that processing registry and you see me using this tab completion thing here, it has a function algorithms, the processing registry, which, which is returned by like this here, return, uh, creates and uh, instantiates a, a, an object uh, processing registry, which, which has all the um, different algorithm algorithms which are loaded at the at the at the time of, of it being initialized, uh, and then this uh, registry has has a function uh, called algorithms, which returns a list of all al algorithms. Um, now, uh, if we search for something specific, we can either either th stroll uh, crawl through it. But that might not be very convenient. Also, apparently the cache of this window is, is not long enough that we can see all of them. Um, or we um, define a search term. Say we want to know um, which tools have buffer in their name. And then use the list comprehension to show the algorithm ID for all algorithms in this list uh, if their algorithm ID contains our search term. And then this list is a lot shorter. Also, this is the ID we need to know. Um, and here would be, for example, this native buffer which is the normal buffer we just uh, used before. And you can see how there's different providers. So there's GDAL and they usually, or they're always, it's like these IDs are provider colon name of the tool. And uh, there's GDAL, GRASS, Native and QGIS here. Uh, Native and QGIS both have this QGIS logo, so they're hard to tell apart. And uh, say we now uh, want to use this uh, GDAL, uh, this native buffer algorithms algorithm, we can find out more about um, the arguments it takes uh, by running a processing algorithm help and passing the ID of the tool. And then we would be presented with this text online help, which is currently the best help you can get to the Python interface of, of uh, processing tools. So it would tell us here what the algorithm does, basically then uh, what the different arguments do, what different parameters, um, and then what kind of input input parameters it, it accepts, and what kind of, of type they are and also which outputs we should expect. And um, yes, actually we can jump into, into our main task. Um, the idea is that, that we um, create a script which loops over all of the features, all of the species in, in this uh, species range map. Um, and uh, rasterizes each of them. So um, maybe we need to make it a short step aside and uh, look at how rasterizing vector layers actually works. So we assume that 
uh, each um, and we typically have one column of the vector features uh, which is going to be imprinted into the roster so here it's it's an ID column, so it says one, two, or actually it's not ID because the two exists twice. So it's some kind of column um, which exists in, in the vector and which is done then um, put into the raster uh, where this vector exists. Um, and if there's empty space, like in our example, there's plenty, which is not covered by, by any of the, of the polygon features. Um, then um, these rasterizing algorithms would typically put a zero. Um, here's a different uh, image I also thought quickly found on Google Image Search. So if you just search for uh, GIS rasterizing image search, you would end up like a lot of these of these uh, examples. Uh, and you can see here how um, this V1 column is is used for rasterization in this case. So. You have the, the features and how they're being uh, distributed, uh, like how, how the vector, uh, the raster cells, the grid cells are filled with the values of this particular column. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a few steps we need to do. Um, and the first one is exactly for this rasterization, uh, we should uh, add to this uh, feature table um, uh, to this attribute table of the features, um, a, a column which which simply has say a, a number one in it. There is some which which do exist, but they they actually have a meaning. So it says it's the origin of the species, or it's a seasonal um, range where they where they don't exist all all year round. So um, it might work to use one of those columns for this particular data set of, of uh, damselfish, but if we um, want to do that for, for say, different species, a uh, different family of fish, uh, then suddenly this, this tool would not uh, work anymore. So what we're going to do is we add another column um, which is filled with ones like for the entire data set, uh, which would then, uh, upon rasterization, mean that where this uh, feature is there's going to be ones in the roster and where there's no feature there's going to be zeros and we're going to use uh, basically a field calculator except that there is of course a field calculator in this toolbox calculator yes which works very similar to um, this field calculator up here it also looks very much the same, the interface. Um, yeah. But we want to use it from Python, which means we have to, where is that window? Oh, here it is, okay. Which means we have to find out uh, what the idea of this field calculator tool actually is. So again, we define our search term and let's say it's called field calculator, let's hope for it, and search for it, and yeah, there's this QGIS field calculator, and uh, we don't know the interface, so let's use the processing algorithm help uh, to display the exact uh, inputs and outputs it has. And uh, you'll see here, it rightfully describes that this algorithm computes a new vector layer with the same feature as features as the input layer and one additional attribute or one recalculated and um, we have several input parameters so input and input layer which is kind of straightforward um, um, we we have a field name that's uh, where how the resulting field name is, is supposed to be called the type of the field is something special here uh, because it's a uh, it's an enumeration and enumer enumerate uh, variable um, and uh, that this is like this kind of lookup variable so we want to we want it to be integer so uh, integer whole whole uh, number um, numbers non-decimal numbers um, which uh, is <laughs> is represented by one here so you would supply one and not integer as a, as a string and um, the others are pretty much 
what you would expect from the field calculator. We still want to uh, say that we want to create a new field instead of overwriting an existing one. And the output is another vector layer. All right, we continue uh, with creating an empty script now that we know uh, what the first tool uh, tool's parameters are. And we create a new script for this uh, processing toolbox and uh, that works uh, by clicking this little Python button here, Python icon button, and uh, choosing create new script. We could now also create a new script from a template, but the template uh, supplied here is quite complex for this uh, lesson. It, it uh, also has all the bells and whistles and, and does the job. Um, but uh, for this uh, course, we created a simpler template, uh, which is in the written material. So uh, we can just copy and paste it from over here. You remember the web pages. And I just copy and paste this from, it's in processing script. So this entire block of code and paste it into here. And um, this is now a short trip into object-oriented programming. And you already had a few discussions in previous lessons on um, good programming styles and uh, object-oriented programming is definitely the paradigm of programming uh, at the moment or has been since 20, 30 years. Uh, and it's definitely something you want to look into closer. Uh, but unfortunately, like a really thorough introduction would really be too much for the scope of this lesson. Um, so let's just um, say this class we, we create here is a blueprint for QGIS to later um, make a self-containing object. Um, and this object then uh, provides public methods and keeps its data private. So it has uh, in specifically a few methods which we going to change a, a couple of methods we're going to we're going to change so we would we will work on this init algorithm and on this process algorithm in the next uh, few minutes um, and uh, we're going to change the name it this it, it returns when it's asked uh, for its display name um, but uh, as a very first thing we rename this class so it's not called rename this and um, since we're programming a tool um, which is supposed to rasterize species range maps. Um, I just propose a name which is descriptive for that. So we want to have a species, a species range maps rasterizer, which is a typical name for, or uh, like to have the, the, the verb uh, made into a noun uh, at the end of a, of a class name is, is quite typical. And, and fulfills most of the conventions. Another convention is that we use this uh, caps word style of, of, of writing the names. That is, uh, if it consists of multiple words, each word starts with a capital letter, while all the others are uh, uh, minuscules. And um, the class name, the class, uh, like the blueprint, um, also starts with a capital letter. That's convention. You can see it up here too. What we import from QGIS core is class R classes and they start with a capital letter. While the instance, which we won't use today, but just to give you a glimpse, the instance of, of uh, like the object we create from this uh, from this blueprint uh, will have will not have a uh, capital will not start with a capital letter. Um, another thing we want to change here still is like the display name, which is um, what what this uh, function this method display name uh, is is returning if uh, if it's if it's queried and that's exactly what's what's being put into this description this name of the of the tool in the toolbox and we want to like in accordance with for example download file but most of the processing toolbox tools uh, they're usually a verb and an object so we would now again describe what our tool does. So it rasterizes species range maps. And then we save it and give it a good name, but leave it in the standard location because that's where QGIS is gonna look for it. Species range maps uh, rasterizer. Here's a good name here. 
Yes. So now we have that thing running. And uh, you might have noticed down here, there's now a new uh, provider of, of these tools. And it's called scripts and voila, voila, there's rasterized spacious range, uh, species range maps. And I could already run that, but it just uh, finishes immediately because there's nothing specified in here. That's why we start uh, by um, specifying which parameter our tools, tool accepts. So if we maybe revisit, for example, the buffer tool, then or our custom buffer tool we, we made earlier, then you see that we have two different inputs. So the one or one input, input layer, and um, we can specify the location of the output layer as an input. And um, for this rasterizing species layer, we, we need three different inputs. Um, that is one vector layer, um, one field in this, in this vector layer, which, which tells us which species it is. So we can uh, filter by distinct species. Um, and uh, then one output folder where we should save all the rasters we create. Um, and um, to do that, uh, these uh, parameters are specified as uh, QGIS, uh, QGS processing parameters. So um, we can again search for this uh, processing parameter. You can search for this in the API documentation. And we're going to see that there's exactly those which which can be specified in, in all those tools. So we want to have one vector layer, we want to have one field, and we want to have one folder destination. And um, if we open the details, we can see how to, uh, how to specify them. So vector layer accepts or requires one parameter called name, one parameter a code description that's optional though that's like a user uh, like a human readable name uh, and then we can still supply um, the types it accepts so like if you want to limit uh, which types it accepts and uh, a default value and whether it's optional and we're gonna use the self add parameter function of a uh, method of QGS GS processing algorithm to add a new algorithm here. And that's, as we just looked up, uh, going to be a processing parameter vector layer, which we will name input layer and the description which is shown to the user in, in the user interface uh, is supposed to be species range layer or species range polygons. Um, and we only accept certain types. Um, that is, we want to accept only QGS processing source type and that's something else I looked up from the API documentation but let's skip over that in the interest of time uh, on the type vector polygons and we added this parameter but we still need to import this type or uh, this class from up here so we can use this in our script and apparently I made another mistake because it types because we can sp specify multiple we can remove that pass now since our function already does something we can add the second parameter which was supposed to be a QGS processing parameter field and again we want to have a name which is the um, say sp species field this name is like a variable name in 
uh, the dictionary we later will receive in the in the actual parameter. So we we know where uh, this parameter was saved, uh, while the description we enter here is what is shown to the user. So it could be field containing species names. And um, these are necessary for any tool, so I didn't have to look that up. Um, but typically you want to then look up what, what parameters are necessary. We don't need a default uh, value, uh, but we maybe want to specify a parent layer parameter name. So uh, once we chose um, this vector, this input layer, which is also what we type in here, uh, the fields uh, to be selected down here for the, for the second parameter would, uh, co would be the fields of this layer. And what else was there here? Um, oh yeah, and we want to specify the type. Let's say it's string because then we can use it for uh, also for the file names. And so we only accept species names in strings, which is maybe anyway a sensible decision. Type is supposed to be QGIS processing parameter field string. And it now gave an error because I forgot, I saved without importing that. Um, class first. And we want to add a third parameter, which is the output directory. And output directories were called, like the parameter was called folder destination. And folder destination accepts a name and a description. And uh, then we could still specify default value, which is not necessary, and uh, whether it's um, optional, which it isn't. So we want to add here QTS processing parameter folder destination. And this has a name which is called output folder and a description which is called <laughs> output folder, but nicely written. And there we are. Oh, again, I forgot to specify this one. Import it at folder destination. Is there another error here? No. Still, it doesn't show. It doesn't update here the script list, but that's all right for now. We can also run it from here, and you see that we have three different inputs. The first being um, selecting a layer, and it's called species range polygons, and we could select here our damsel fish distributions layer. You can select a field containing species names, um, and you can see that we only have the layer at uh, the fields which are of value string in here and binomial is um, coincidentally the layer uh, the field we want uh, and we can specify an output folder here and I'm gonna make uh, a new folder in downloads which is called species ranges and we could run that now but it doesn't do anything but it runs so it runs successfully but very fast.
and it doesn't do anything because we didn't implement any logic yet. This is what we're going to do now and add to the processing algorithm down here. Um, we already looked up um, the, the syntax to run uh, this field calculator and that's going to be the first thing we do. So um, you see that uh, this processing algorithm um, is, is passed a, a variable, like an argument which is called parameters um, and another one which is called context and feedback. These are easy, we can just pass them to the function. And uh, we're going to use processing.run, which is a method of, of this processing module, um, to run this, um, um, this uh, processing, uh, this algorithm. And we use this QTS field calculator. Uh, what you have to supply to processing run is, um, is two things or actually five things, but two things are important. The one is the ID of this tool, and then the second one is the dictionary of uh, the parameters. So we would now say of the arguments that input, like this here, the input layer, should be what our user chose in the parameters to be saved in the variable input layer. The new field name, which is over here, is the new field. Uh, we can just hard code because we are only going to use it inside this tool. And uh, also the field type is uh, supposed to be integer. Field length and precision we can leave at the standard. We want to say that it's. We want to specify that it's uh, a new field being added, as opposed to um, recalculating another field. And our formula is not exactly rocket science because it always equates to one. And then um, I already said there's uh, five parameters we can supply in total. Uh, we will uh, only supply four. That is, we pass context and feedback on to this processing.run. Uh, that is important so we see um, we see how how quickly this uh, how, how the progress of, of this uh, algorithm is in the window in the uh, user interface. So yeah, that's that's our first step. So let's try that. It's saved successfully. I can run it here and choose again this folder I created before. And I'm gonna run it. And it actually needs another parameter which is required. I, I thought we can save that one, but we have it in the written in the written instructions and I'm going to copy and paste it from there. Uh, we have to supply an output destination and this is in our case a memory layer and we just uh, have to supply a, a unique name here and I just chose this really long string to describe it. and then it works. Yes, it takes three seconds to add a layer, uh, one, one column to one field to the, to the whole model. Oh, I know why our script doesn't show up here, because we had been searching for buffer, so obviously it is here. So that's the first step. Um, Let's maybe label that. And um, we can add a step zero, which is a bit of a, a check for sanity. 
um, which is we try to see whether the, the output directory exists. And otherwise uh, create it. The easiest way to do that is use this OS make directories and we want to use the Oh, actually, no, we can just use this parameters output folder, which we ask the user to sp uh, supply here. And we say create it, but if it exists, it doesn't matter either. As a second step, we want to find out how many distinct species or which distinct species there are in, in our data set. And we do that by using a function of the um, vector layer. is called unique values and unique values uh, needs not a field name but instead a field index which is why we have to find out that one before and we know the field name because our user specifies it here as species field so we want to first Uh, find the field index or oh, we first create a variable with all the fields and we use this input layer parameter here and get all its fields to save here and then we want to find the index in these fields from its name and the name is what the user supplied as species field. And then we get a list of species names from, um, again, having our input layer, our input layer's unique values for this field index, which we just found out. And then what we do want to do next is we want to loop over all these species. So we say for species name in species names, then we make another check here if the species name is empty, which might ha happen, then we don't export it. That is, we do the opposite. We only proceed if the species name is not null. And I put a pass here so we can safely save it. Otherwise, uh, the uh, script is not valid because there would be an indentation, nothing like a colon and indentation, but nothing following. And it would be syntax error. Um, because we now have to think which algorithm we want to proceed with, we are again going to use uh, this Python console to find out what we want to do. And uh, the next step would be to select all attributes which are um, in um, uh, which which are of this particular species name. So there's select by attribute exactly that one and you can search for that in here Let's say our search time term is attribute search for them and then there's here select by attribute and that's exactly what you want to use we want to find out more about its syntax to 
is it is a bit longish and since we just did that for the other tool I'm just gonna copy it from the written documentation the output of this processing run here so the algorithm output is what what is being returned here and this one doesn't belong here either it's supposed to be done here at the very end of the function and algorithm output uh, contain is a dictionary and uh, it contains exactly what um, this help tells us is in outputs. So it's a dictionary with one entry which is called output, which is a vector layer. So we can safely say like let's put it into this variable, which we're gonna use a few lines down and say this should contain our algorithm output. So um, like um, value at the index output. Yes. Maybe comment here. So, so far so good. Then we should have, like what this does is selects attributes uh, from uh, which uh, the zero is, is, again, let's see, let's, let's go through the, through the different parameters. The input is uh, the, the output of the previous tool. So we, we got our output up here and we use that as the input for this tool. Um, then as the field, we want to use uh, the species attribute field, which our users, a species field, we call that here, which our user chose as the operator, which is an equal sign, which is zero in this uh, enumerate. Um, as the value, we want to use the current species name out of our loop and um, our method is to create a new selection. So we don't want to add to, to a new set, like it's a bit like holding down shift, control, alt to modify the selection or create a new selection. And uh, we want to create a new selection. And again, our output is a layer and we use the same thing here and have them like the range polygon of polygons of a single species inside this layer, inside this variable. Then we had rightfully put that as 3B in the written documentation because we still have a 3A step, which is rather simple, but still should be done. We want to um, find out our out or, or save the, the output name into a variable. And we do that by joining the output folder with our species name and then later we're still gonna add an extension to that. just used os.path which is why we're supposed to import it up here also we actually used os before already
next we're going to use the rasterizer itself. Um, although there's one, one step in between because the rasterizer algorithm is not, is not accepting these um, memory uh, vector layers, uh, we have to save it uh, first into an actual shape file. And again, I'm go going to step a bit faster here and copy and paste uh, the code from our written examples. Just put it into the right place. And we're going to save a shape file here. And you can see that it's a really easy um, uh, algorithm here, really easy tool. It's, it's the save selected features. And so it's native save uh, selected features. And you can see that it only accepts um, one input name or two input parameters. The one is like an input layer, the other one is an output, for example, file name. And that's exactly what we supply here. We say output file plus um, an extension. So um, QGIS also knows how to, how to save it. Uh, and again, we capture this uh, output of the algorithm and um, use only this one um, like there's only again one output only which is called output and we save that into this variable which now refers to this output file and uh, the next step is the is now really the actual rasterizer and again gonna quickly copy it from over here And what we use is this cheetah rasterize. What happened here? Let's look at its uh, syntax. This is a bit more complicated. We have a lot of parameters, but the description reads it rasterizes uh, vector layer to raster layer and it accepts as input, uh, an input layer, uh, which field to, to burn into, into the raster. Like, remember um, this one, like which, which uh, field to burn really in, into, the, into the raster and which, which uh, value to use for, for the raster cells. And we created it before, it's this presence field then we want to know uh, how wide and how high the, the resulting raster should be. And uh, we choose pixels as, as the units for that. So we want, to, we want it to be 2000 pixels wide and uh, 1000 high. Um, as the extent we want to use, and there's a lot of different ways of, of supply of uh, specifying the extent here. Um, but we want to simply use the entire world in the WGS48 uh, we're using, or the input file is in. Um, then we want, like the raster type is, is, the, is uh, the number, where, where is it actually, the, the number format of the, of the output raster. Oh, where is that? Very. No, it's actually called data underscore type. So that's in fact what you want. So apparently this was renamed since yesterday. That's a bit interesting. And we want to specify an output file. And we already created this output file without extension, uh, which is the output folder plus the species name. So we just add uh, dot tiff to create a tiff file. Um, and that's pretty much everything. What we still did in the written documentation is uh, we delete um, 
the shape files we created in, in the meantime. But let's skip that for now. And save that tool. And then let's try to run it and see what, what it does what we want. I bet it does. So we choose this layer, we choose this field, and we choose to output them to here. And if I run that now, surprisingly, ah yeah, I just I just made a stupid mistake changing a different uh, programming languages. Um, null doesn't exist in that way in in Python, but it's actually non is not non. Run it again. Hopefully this time it works. Okay, we did some copy and pasting mistakes in line 105. Um, this field, oh no, that's not even copy and pasting, that's me mistyping. Species field is, is called wrongly. It's actually called, like it's actually not with a capital, starting with a capital letter. And now, still some typo, I guess, because we did define an output file. Oh yeah, I renamed that to output file name, which was a bad idea if I only rename it at one occurrence and not at all of them. So I changed that up here, so all of them are called output file. drum rolls. Yeah, there we are. So you can see now we loop over all of these uh, different species. And our um, algorithm finished. And we can see how, for example, this file should have been saved. Home my, my home directory downloads species ranges chromiskrusma.tiff. Let's see how that file looks like. So my home directory downloads species ranges chromiskrusma.tiff. Is that file doing what you want? Yes, it is. Isn't that wonderful? So, so it seems Kronis Krusma is that thing down here. And it's burned into this raster, which has values. No. Which has values zero everywhere except here, where the species actually had its range polygon, where it has one. And just for, uh, to thank you for watching this until the very end, let's add all of these TIFF files. At once. set them all to very transparent and we're gonna have this drawing of different color colors but let's do it still a bit nicer Let's turn that uh, color to be white to black instead. 
and set it to be, say, some blue. And now we have the species map of this particular genus or this particular family. Maybe we can have a bit less transparency so you see more of it. So it's something like in this range. Apply to all of them. And it doesn't really work as, as I expected, but still, thank you for watching. Um, I still have uh, a couple of resources I wanted to remind you of. Um, there is this QGIS Python API documentation, which is incredibly va uh, valuable if you, if you start out uh, programming anything in, in Python. Um, then there's this... Um, Python uh, Py QGIS developer cookbook, uh, which is basically walking you from really simple hello world examples until writing your own uh, Python applications in like standalone, just using Python modules. So you can write, I don't know, your own app, which has a map window, which has GIS functionality using Python only. Um, I have it open here too, yes. Um, and finally, um, I would invite you to walk through the, through the written example. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of, of comments, which I now didn't mention in, the, in this video. Um, and it might be worth uh, trying it yourself to see whether you understood everything. Yeah, thanks for watching and uh, see you soon.